Welcome to B News Weekly. I'm Phil Gallagher along with B News Director Rich Hosford, B News reporters Tad Stefanak and Robert Paris, Maddie Shipka doing double duty on the community calendar and the weather, and Matt DiMarzio with sports. Thank you for joining us. Two Burlington residents have been arrested and an illegal assault rifle was seized following an investigation. According to Burlington Police Chief Michael Kent, Brendan Shields, 31 of Burlington, was arrested for having possession of an illegal assault rifle. Shields has no license to carry or firearms ID card and his criminal record precludes him from owning firearms. Detectives applied for and obtained a search warrant of Shields' residence on Dennis Drive in Burlington and a search was conducted this past Friday morning. Burlington police took caution during the search and received mutual aid assistance from the Northeast Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council, uh, the SWAT team, in case of the presence of a high-powered firearm. During the search, investigators discovered an AR-15 with a loaded 30-round magazine, uh, two large bags of spent shell casings, and numerous rifle parts. Shields was charged with possession of a large-capacity firearm, possession of a large-capacity feeding device, and a firearm violation with two prior viol uh, violent or drug crimes on his record. Kent said the case was the product of strong detective work by the Burlington Department who received and verified information about a dangerous felon in possession of a deadly assault rifle. He credited the diligent work of the town's police officers to get both the suspect and the weapon out of circulation. Also at the scene, arrested at the scene, was Priscilla Perry, 36, of Burlington. Perry was found with numerous arrest warrants for shoplifting. Shields is currently being held without bail pending a dangerousness hearing. A, Shashin, a student at Shawshin Valley Regional Vocational Technical High School, which hosts students from multiple area towns, including Burlington, has been arrested for making a threatening video. Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan, Tewksbury Chief of Police Timothy Sheehan, and Bill Ricker Chief of Police Daniel Rosa said in a statement that 15 year old, a 15-year-old male has been arrested and charged with threatening use of a dangerous weapon and threatening to commit a crime in connection with allegedly distributing a Snapchat video that depicted him holding a weapon that looked like an assault rifle and threatening to commit a school shooting. That weapon was later determined by police to be an airsoft rifle that shoots BBs. On Monday at approximately 10.34 p.m., police responded to a Tewksbury home at the request of the juvenile's mother who had located a video that depicted the male showing the airsoft rifle in an attempt to make it appear real and making threatening remarks, uh, stated a release. Police located the video and subsequently located the air rifle and another air, air gun, handgun, and took possession of them. No firearms were located in the home. The juvenile is a student at Shawshin. The prim uh, preliminary investigation suggests the video was distributed to four students at the school. According to authorities, investigators do not believe this video was circulated beyond these students. Investigators are not aware of any existing threat to the school. There was an increased police presence at the school on Monday out of an abundance of caution and to ensure police were able to address any remaining concerns of students, parents, school officials, and the community. The student was arraigned in Lowell Juvenile Court on Monday. With the exception of youthful offender cases, juvenile court proceedings are closed to the public. During Tuesday night's school committee meeting, the Burlington Police Department held a brief discussion about school safety and their protocols for keeping students safe. School safety is now, as has been, a national problem that has been affecting schools throughout the United States. Parents are trying to keep their children safer in school after the recent shootings which happened in Parkland, Florida, leaving 17 dead and 14 injured. At the meeting, Detective Sergeant Tim McDonough, Youth Services Detective Tom Fournier, and Police Chief Michael Kent gave a presentation on school protocols and answered questions on how they are working with the Burlington Public Schools to assure student safety. McDonough explained that the police use the school facilities to train officers and get them familiar with the different buildings. He said after hours, officers do drills at night and use their probes, a card which has, allows an officer to access any school in town. During the day, officers are constantly near school facilities in case something should arise. Fournier said that during the day, he is at the high school and school resource officer Keith Shepard is at the middle school. Police acknowledge that students are safer in their classrooms because they can be locked down. 
School Committee member Kristen Russo raised concerns about students being in an open area within the school, such as the lunchroom cafeteria. Detective Fournier assured the school committee that if an incident were to happen in the cafeteria, police would attempt to respond as quickly as possible, but acknowledged it is a more difficult scenario. During the school shooting of, in Parkland, the perpetrator purposely pulled the fire alarm to lure students out of their classrooms, believing it was an actual fire. A person at the school committee meeting asked if the police are looking into this type of a scenario. If the shooter is able to pull the fire alarm, police will try to lower the actual noise of the alarm itself. By doing this, they can get in contact with students and teachers through the intercom, explaining that the shooter is attempting to get people out of the rooms and that there was no actual fire happening. Finally, school committee members said they were thankful to the Burlington Police Department for working very diligently and closely with the schools to ensure the safety of the students. On Tuesday evening, the school committee heard, uh, heard a summary of a report created by the CPA firm Powers & Sullivan that examined the Burlington High School Music and Performing Arts Revolving Account. The report, which looked at in-depth at the fund for fiscal years 15 through 17, was done after initial examination of the fund by the CPS firm Roselli Clark & Associates that was submitted last summer which found numerous problems with the fund and accounting practices associated with it. The first issue is that since 2015, the fund has been running a deficit. In FY15, uh, they found uh, an overall decrease of 40,000 that was partially made up with a $10,000 subsidy from other funds. In FY16, the fund lost $37,000 and received a $20,000 subsidy. However, in 17, the fund lost $45,000 and had no subsidy, leaving it with a deficit of $51,000. A large majority of the losses came from funding the Community Concert Series, a program for the community that has since been discontinu discontinued. Powers and Sullivan said in the report that programs like the Community Concert Series are not necessarily supposed to be money makers, but that under Massachusetts general law, Revolving funds cannot run in a deficit, and so the funds need to be made whole from other sources. The report also highlights some issues with practices engaged in by the music department. One was keeping an unofficial cash reserve in a safe with upwards of 14000 in it that was reportedly used for miscellaneous expenses. These funds were not reported to or delivered to the town treasurer as they should have been. Another issue was that during performances, they had two staff members selling tickets at the door with their, who were remunerated uh, $40 an hour on, on weekdays and $60 an hour on weekends. These employers were paid. That these employers were paid was not an issue, but that they were usually paid in cash, which is against the rules. Finally, there was an issue with tickets sold either before the show in cash or checks at the door. The department used an online program, TIX, for its sales. Any ticket bought online was registered and could be traced and accounted for. However, the department did not use it to accurately account for tickets sold for cash or checks. Further, the department would preprint out comp tickets that were sold at the door, and these two could not be fully accounted for after the fact. The report said that the CPAs estimated that at least $14,000 of cash expenditures were made over the past three years from funds not deposited with the town treasurer. However, they cannot be sure due to the lack of documentation uh, that should have been kept for accounting purposes. School committee members said they and the administration take full responsibility for the lack of proper accounting, and they will use the report and the previous one as a starting point to make the necessary policy changes to ensure all funds are properly managed in the future. Some of these policies, such as the one regarding comp tickets and at-the-door sales, have already been put in place. During Monday night's Board of Selectmen meeting, Chairman Chris Hartling read a special letter regarding the Burlington native and Olympic gold medal winner Katie, Kaylee Flanagan. The letter was sent in by Vice President Mike Pence. In the letter, Pence congratulates Flanagan and her teammates for representing the U.S. in the Olympics. Vice President Pence said he was privileged to walk, watch American athletes go for the gold during his time in South Korea, and the team's actions on the ice were akin to the strength of the nation. Here is Chris Hartling reading the letter. From the office of the Vice President, uh, as 
leader of the United States delegation to the 2018 Olympic Winter Games. I am proud to join the people of Burlington in honoring your community's own Callie Flanagan as a member of the U.S. Olympic team, uh, women's hockey team in, I'm hoping I'm saying this correctly, Pyeongchang, South Korea. Together, the members of our Olympic team represent the strength of our nation and the destiny of American greatness at home and around the world. I join Americans everywhere in applauding these athletes, cheering them on as they reach for their dreams. So on behalf of the American people, I want you to know how proud we are of your community for representing America on the world stage. Please know that I'll be rooting for Cali and rallying behind Team USA as they compete in the Winter Olympic Games. Uh, may God bless the people of Burlington. May God bless our 2018 Olympic team. And may God bless the United States of America. Well, God did bless uh, at least the uh, women's uh, hockey team at the Olympics who, um, with the help of Burlington's own Callie Flanagan, won the gold medal in a thrilling, uh, that game went to a shootout. And if, if you're any kind of a sports fan, I would probably try to find that and watch it because it was, as far as athletic and sports spectacles go, it was pretty spectacular. Congratulations, Kelly Flanagan. Martian Sports Skills is an organization that started the middle school league concept to bring back the ability for friends to play with friends. Burlington's represent, representation to the league are some tough and competitive hockey players who are exceeding expectations in their fight to the championship. B News reporter Tad Stefanak has more on the Burlington's newest up and coming hockey team. Let's have a look. They're fast. They're physical. They shoot. And they score. Meet the Maulers, Burlington's first middle school aged hockey team for girls. Burlington native, U.S. women's hockey gold medalist, Callie Flanagan has been the toast of the town. And these young ladies are Burlington's up and coming hockey hopefuls. It's competitive. Yeah, it's competitive. It's team bonding. You get to make new friends and stuff. So. Yeah. yeah. I'm coming to play some aggressive hockey and I'm gonna, we're going to win today. It's just, it's a great sense of rush, you know. I'm a goalie, so teammates, depending on me for a while, that's just, it feels good. It's like aggressive. A lot of the other sports I did, I didn't really like, but I like hockey, so. This is the first year that we've actually had enough Burlington girls to form a middle school team. So we decided to put them together and join the league and put a team in. I saw my friend Kobe play hockey, so it got me interested. Most of my family plays hockey. I also come from a hockey family. I also am determined. To, I want to play hockey for Harvard, and so I'll, that's my goal. They really want to learn, and that's good, good for the team because they really, you know, they make it fun for us. They make it exciting, and we get to teach them some good things that they might not learn in their, in their town league or their, uh, their club team. So it's, it's really exciting. And so what they try to do is make it advantageous for all the girls to play at a good time. They play with their friends. Proud of them, uh, I think, for our first year coming together. Uh, we're actually the fifth seed out of ten. Exceeded our expectations of where we thought we were going to be, so hopefully tonight we can keep going. It's, it's really fun, and, you know, if you're looking for just a small hockey team, one it's like one game a re weekend. It's pretty fun. Good teammates, good coaches, and it's just really fun. You just got to play hard and have fun. From the Gallant Arena at Merrimack College, I'm B News reporter Tad Stefanak. Back to you in the studio. Trash and recycling pickup is poised to start costing the town more money, and the practice of providing free recycling for white goods may end. This came out as part of the discussion on the proposed fiscal year 19 budget for the DPW that was held at Monday night's Board of Selectmen meeting. DPW Director John Sanchez said that the biggest driver behind the department uh, budget increase is trash and recycling. The reason, he said, is that the biggest importer of recyclable items, China, is changing its policies while the wages for local employees are increasing. China has been putting up new restrictions on the separation of the recyclables, 
and on how it's uh, delivered to them and it is raising costs. Also, the prevailing wages to contract employees, which are set by the state, have gone up since the last contract. Sanchez said that nobody wants to carry the number within their budget, so when he went out for proposals, he saw that the contract is going to go up and go up dramatically. That, uh, that raise also looks more dramatic because since 2009, when a new five-year contract started, that was joined by area communities as a way to save money. The price of trash and recycling has been low. In 2008, the town paid $1.7 million, which dropped to $1.6 in 2010. In 2011, uh, where the company uh, the town does business with was changed, the cost was $1.5 million. Also, the incinerator contract changed. And while other years since have seen prices go up and down a little bit, the overall cost since 2009 has been relatively low and stable. However, based on contract negotiations the town has undertaken ahead of the expiration of the current contract in June, the estimated cost for fiscal year 2019 is $1.9 million. John Sanchez told the board that one way to maintain the cost of trash and recycling pickup is to end the practice of free removal of white items. This is a term for a lot electronics, such as televisions, monitors, refrigerators, stoves, washing machines, etc. In most towns, residents must pay to have these items taken off their hands, and it seems likely Burlington will join their ranks in the near future. The service of pro providing free pickup of these items is roughly $100,000 annually. The board will likely take up the measure in an upcoming meeting, though even if passed, uh, that will not go into effect immediately. Town Administrator John Petron said any changes would be implemented starting in July and the beginning of the fiscal year. Other aspects of trash and recycling pickup, like it or not, have a fee for regular waste, and a one day per week pickup for the entire town will not be affected. On the subject of trash and recycling, two Burlington High School students are working to dramatically reduce the amount of trash item, one trash item that can now be found in, abuz uh, in abundance, excuse me, uh, the ubiquitous plastic bag. B News Director Rich Hosford went to talk with them about their proposal and he files this report. A group of Burlington High School students have formed a new group to help make positive changes in the community and help protect the natural environment. All right, so really this September we started a club called the Global Activists, which is, had a motive of the students pushing for environmental action in our community because we want to get involved and make a change because global warming and climate change really are like happening and students need to start taking the step at a young age instead of just as older citizens who will be oblivious to it, we need to start taking changes now. So really we want to get students involved in their community just to make something happen. The first mission the group is undertaking is a ban on all plastic bags at Burlington stores. They have appeared before the Conservation Commission, which unanimously approved of their proposal, and the Board of Selectmen, which will take a vote up at an upcoming meeting. Their ultimate goal is to get a Warren article banning the use of plastic bags in stores before town meeting. The reason, they said, is because the bags are damaging to, to the environment, require the use of CO2 to create, which drives climate change, and they are difficult to dispose of properly. In Massachusetts, we get 125 tons of plastic bags in the landfills. And even if they are recycled, we don't have the proper machinery to dispose of them. If you wanted to dispose of them completely, you could go to your local grocery market. But in Massachusetts, we don't have the sufficient machinery to dispose of these bags entirely into the recycling facilities. This means many bags end up in landfills where they can find their way into the natural environment. Uh, on average, about 100 billion plastic bags are used in the U.S., and around 13 million are used in Burlington. So these bags, usually they end up on the ground or somewhere in the woods. I'm sure you've seen them in Burlington somewhere. And what these bags do, if the animals eat them and they consume them, it can be very harmful to them. So if they get caught in trees, a bird sees it, doesn't know what it is, he'll eat it or she'll eat it, and uh, it'll, it, could, it could die from it. And in water, these things, uh, these plastic bags, they don't biodegrade. Instead, they break down into little particles called microplastics. And what these microplastics do, if, if a fish consumes them, they're literally consuming plastic bags. So if the fish consume the bags, then obviously it's inside them. So when we eat it, we're literally eating plastic bags, and this can be super harmful to us. The club members say that while it would definitely be a change for Burlington to ban plastic bags, it would not be an unprecedented move. Obviously, Burlington is not making this whole new crazy idea of a bag ban. There have been 61 other towns and cities with a very similar bag bill passed. 
and they include bag bands and also bag bills which have a charge of five or ten cents on the use of plastic bags. So uh, restricting bag usage has been going on in Massachusetts and it's really happening a lot. As I said again, 61 towns and cities have already done a very similar bill. So Burlington is not going to be the first to do it, but it will still make a really, really big impact on the community. The young activists have reached out to stores in some of those towns to get their feedback on the proposal, and they said they have been getting positive responses. So far, we've been getting great responses, especially for the context we've had with all the other towns who've passed this bag ban. Uh, we've gotten great responses. They've said, you know, not every customer can be happy, but they've had almost every single customer come back and still be happy with what they're, what they're receiving. So what alternatives are out there, and what would be the ideal situation? Obviously, we want to see stores and customers use their own reusable bag, but paper is still an option for consumers to use if they were inclined to do so, as paper is also recyclable, which won't be as environmentally harmful as plastic would have been. So paper is one cent more than the plastic bag to produce. However, bags, like reusable bags, are being sold, to, which are our revenue streams. So companies can be making money from just giving out bags. Finally, the club teacher supervisor says he is impressed with the dedication, vision, and drive of the students. I mean, that, this has been um, an amazing thing to see them actually care this much, where they want to take it upon themselves to actually go in front and talk to legislators about getting something done in their town. I mean, as a teacher, you want these things to happen, and it's, I mean, it's pretty inspir inspirational for myself to see that the kids do, you know, you speak to them and they want, they want to actually kind of have a grassroots effort and get something done themselves. You know, they're not just putting something on Twitter. They actually want to be involved with the legislative process and, and do something about it, which is awesome to see and kind of helps me as a teacher continue doing what I do. So, I mean, I'm very proud of these, these kids. With the global activist, I'm B News Director Rich Hosford. The Burlington Police Department welcomed two new members to the force on Monday night. Chief Michael Kent was at the Board of Selectmen meeting to recommend the appointment of two full-time officers to fill positions that will be made vacant by retirements. At the recommendation of the Chief, Town Administrator John Petron appointed Officer Jalissa Smith and Officer Daniel Main. Officer Smith graduated from Framingham State University in 2013 before attending both the Reserve Intermittent Police Academy in Boylston and later the Worcester Police Academy, a, le a release from the department stated. She most recently worked as an officer with the UMass Worcester Police Department. Prior to her appointment there, she worked in banking and also assisted in caring for horses at the Emerald Isle e e Eventing Center in Westboro. Uh, officer Maine graduated with a bachelor's degree in juvenile justice from Wheelock College in 2011. He was a four-year starter on the Wheelock basketball team and served for two years as team captain while reaching 1,000 points scored over the course of his career. He then worked as a youth mentor as well as in construction before moving on to the Methuen Police Academy where he earned the Outstanding Officer Award for his exceptional overall performance during the program. He graduated from the academy on February 23rd. Starting on Tuesday, both officers begin an in-depth 12-week field training program before being assigned to full-time shifts. Manager Petron said the two new officers are another example of the great applicants that the town has been able to hire. He said many great candidates have applied to be officers in town, and he believes they are able to choose the cream of the crop. Board of Selectmen Chairman Chris Hartling said that from the feedback he has received from residents, he agrees with Pet Petron's assessment of the department. He said he has been sent many emails from residents happy with the department, adding that he believes people feel safe in their neighborhoods. The Burlington High School Drama Club is getting ready to perform their upcoming play, Pippin, a revival play by Stephen Schwartz, where the character interacts with the audience, characters interact with the audience. Venus reporter Robert Paris went to talk with the director and some cast members and has this preview. It was a winner of four Tony Awards, including Best Musical Revival in 2013. And now it's coming to the stage at Burlington High. This week I went down to the Fogelberg Performing Arts Center to see a behind the scenes look at the upcoming school production of Stephen Schwartz, Pippin. We're really excited to do Pippin. This is actually the Broadway revival version. We're one of the high, first high schools in the country to have the rights for the revival. 
And it's actually also the 25th anniversary of the Burlington High School production in 1993. And we're, we've invited back the uh, cast and the directors from, uh, from that production. So we're really excited to bring that back to the stage here in Burlington. Pippin has a very interesting and unique storyline. It's a story about a young man named Pippin who's the son of King Charlemagne trying to find his way in the world, trying different things, trying to be a soldier. Uh, he tries to you know, be a farmer. He tries different things in life and doesn't find them very fulfilling. He wants to be extraordinary. He wants to find something very special to be. And he's frustrated and doesn't really find any satisfaction until he learns to find the joys and simple things in life. So, uh, but it's a great a lot of song and dances, a lot of magic. It's something for every age. I think they'll enjoy the show. The title character is joined by a large ensemble of characters that help bring the story to life. Um, so my character's called the leading player, and she's kind of the villain in the show. Um, it may seem like she's Fiffin's friend, but her end goal basically is to like bring him to his darkest desires, I guess. Um, she basically is attempting to create Pippin's downfall. So I play King Charles. Uh, I am Pippin's father. And basically, you know, in Act One, he comes home from the school, and I'm sort of like the deadbeat dad. He comes home, and I'm just like, I want nothing to do with you. Go read a book, do something. And Pippin's like, hey, I want to go to war. And I'm like, yeah, you're not going to war, because I want him to be king. I want him to be alive. But sure enough, if you come to the show, you'll find the irony. That comes with it. So my character is Fastrada is her name and she is basically very cunning and she is kind of like the puppet master of the show. She kind of convinces Pippin to do all the actions that he does without him even knowing and it's a really fun character because she gets to like just kind of like she seems super in innocent and she like repeats the line that she's just like a regular housewife but in reality she's like super smart and like planning everything so her son can be like rising to power as opposed to Pippin. The story would not be complete without the main character himself, Pippin. Pippin is a new graduate from university and um, he finds himself into this um, circus themed play and he doesn't know that he's in it. Um, um, so the circus people, they put him through all these different desires that he would want as a person and um, he tries to go through it just like anybody else would. Pippin is no ordinary play. Unlike most musicals, this one the cast interacts and talks directly to the audience. And there's even a song that is a sing-along. So they get, you know, get the audience literally involved in the production. So that's going to be really exciting. Finally, the cast and crew are trying to make it a special event for young and old. There's a lot of fun songs and dances and magic. So it's an entertaining show to watch. So that's, that's, that's a big piece of it. Uh, as far as the message, I think, like I said, finding the joys in the simple things in life. Certainly go and venture and shoot for the stars, but there's also a lot of, um, a lot of reward to be had in having dinner with friends and family, you know, and, and, and that message is, comes out clear in this show. Pippin will be showing March 16th through the 25th at the Fogelberg Performing Arts Center. Tickets are $10 for students and seniors and $15 for adults. If you'd like to purchase tickets, visit BurlingtonTheater.com or call 781-A-FUN-TICK. From the Fogelberg Performing Arts Center, I'm Robert Paris for B News Weekly. steady stream of talent that uh, comes from the Burlington Music Program. B News weatherman Peter Brown is out this week, but once again we have Maddie Shipka on double duty. Here she is with the weather report and the community calendar. Hello and welcome to the B News weather report. I'm Maddie Shipka filling in for Peter Brown. Let's start with the Almanac. As you can see, we're just about on par for average temperatures of this time of year. We'll start off this cycle at 42 degrees, just one degree above the average temperature for March 2nd of 41 degrees. Sadly, we're well off the record temperature of 66 degrees. And as we march towards spring, the days keep getting longer. On Friday, the sun won't set until 5.36 p.m. We can practically see the incoming season around the bend. However, before we get to the nice weather, we have some more winter to contend with. As we turn to the seven-day forecast, we can see that we're starting off with some bad weather. 
On Friday, the National Weather Service is calling for a mix of rain and snow that will become all snow after 8 p.m. Saturday will likely start with snow before warmer temperatures cause a switch to rain. On both days, high winds are expected with gusts as high as 36 miles per hour. As we move into next week, things will calm down again. On Sunday, we can expect mostly cloudy skies with a high near 40 degrees. Monday and Tuesday will be sunnier with temperatures slightly higher but still average for the time of year. Wednesday may bring some rain and snow mix, but with a temperature of 40 degrees, any snowfall is likely to disappear quickly. Finally, we end our forecast with a sunny Thursday. That's it for this week's B News Weather Report. We expect Peter Brown will be back next week. In the meantime, get out there and enjoy the weather. Hello, I'm Maddie Shipka, and this is your community calendar. Bring your family and enjoy the fun fest of the season. On Saturday, March 10th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Francis Wyman Elementary School, the PTO will be having their annual carnival. Come and enjoy a day full of family fun. There will also be carnival games, food, raffles, and much more. Everyone is welcome. For more information, and if you would like to volunteer at the carnival, visit carnival.francisswymanpto.org. Which move will you make? On Sunday, March 11th, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., the New England Movement Arts will be having a scholastic chess tournament. Come show your chess skills and challenge yourself to see who comes out on top. All levels of chess are provided, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. The event is for kids 15 and under. Pre-registration is required and the cost is $25 for pre-registration and $30 at the door. For more information and to register, visit www.nemovementarts.com dot com slash chess tournament. Ah, spring is in the air. On Thursday, March 22nd, from 6 to 9 p.m., the Burlington Area Chamber of Commerce will be having their annual spring soiree at the Archer Hotel on 3rd Ave. Enjoy a seasonal celebration with over 150 members of the Burlington business community for some delicious food and drink. Everyone is welcome and pre-registration is required. The event costs $50 for members and $75 for non-members. For more information and to register, visit BurlingtonAreaChamberOfCommerce.org. I'm Maddie Shipka, and this has been your Community Calendar. Sure sign of spring. I saw my first robin in the yard this week. Also, unfortunately, a gang of loud and unruly grackles who are assaulting my bird feeders. It's playoff time for the winter season, and some Red Devil teams are still in the middle of the action. For the latest, we go now to News sports reporter Matt DiMarzio, for this week's sports report. Hey everyone, this is Matt DiMarzio here with your weekly sports report. March Madness is still gripping Burlington. On Sunday at 520, the Burlington High boys hockey team will be at the Chelmsford Forum to play Pope Francis in the second round of the Division 1A tournament, also known as the Super 8. The Red Devils kicked off the tournament on Wednesday against St. John's Prep and gave the Eagles all they could handle before dropping an exciting game by a 5-3 score. If Burlington loses on Sunday, the season is over. With a win, Burlington will continue in the tournament and play again on Wednesday at the Forum against either Andover or St. John's Prep of Shrewsbury. Burlington is one of only three public schools in the eight-team draw along with Andover and Hingham. Both the girls and boys basketball teams from BHS qualify for the state tournament. The girls advance to the playoffs on the final day of the regular season by beating Boston Latin, but ended up falling to Wakefield in the first round. The game was tight until the Warriors pulled away in the fourth quarter. The boys lost to Brighton at, in their first round game on Tuesday, 66-55. Brighton jumped out to a huge lead, but the Red Devils would battle back to eventually cut the lead to five before finally running out of time. Burlington's Callie Flanagan was a member of the gold medal winning USA women's hockey team and the community's first ever gold medal winner. In all, Burlington has now had six Olympians, Flanagan, and her teammates were recently on The Ellen Show, and the reports are that Callie will be bringing her gold medal back to show Burlington at some point soon. Speaking of hockey and Burlington, Brian Diffley and the Boston University men's hockey team start the Hockey East playoffs next Friday night at BU against the University of Connecticut. Harvard University and its captain, Eddie Ellis, are also starting their playoffs soon. The Crimson will host their first game next Friday in Cambridge. 
And that is all for your weekly sports report. I am Matt DiMarzio. Back to you guys in the studio. Another week, another photo to highlight. This week we have some Burlington students dressed up as historical figures from the past. It was sent in by Linda McNamee and shows Pine Glen third graders participating in the annual Living Wax Museum. Students chose historic Massachusetts figures, researched them, created presentations, then dressed like them. Family and friends were welcome to the school where the children assumed the roles of the historic figures and were prepared to answer questions about their role. Characters included Deborah Sampson, uh, JFK, Dr. Seuss, Clara Barton, Susan Anthony, Susan B. Anthony, Ben Franklin, Johnny Appleseed, John Adams, and many others. Thank you for the photo, Linda. We'd like to see your photos. They could be of something you see around town, the weather outside your own door, photos of your friends, family members, and pets, whatever you think is interesting and would like to share with the community. Email your photos to bcat at bcattv.org with the subject line photo of the week. Okay, that's it from the news desk here at B News Weekly. I'm Phil Gallagher along with B News Director Rich Hosford. Apparently we're not changing the shot. There we go. B News Director Rich Hosford, B News Reporters Tad Stefanak, Robert Paris, Maddie Shipka with the weather and the community calendar, and Matt DiMarzio with sports. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>